You're listening to Flaunt. Find your sparkle and create a life you love after infidelity or betrayal. Have you been betrayed by life, your body, or someone that you love? You're not alone. No matter what you've been through, Naked Self-Worth helps you regain confidence, joy, and enthusiasm so you can create a life you love and flourish. Tune in weekly and learn how. Hello and welcome to Flaunt. Find your sparkle and create a life you love after infidelity or betrayal. I'm Laura Cheadle and I'm an attorney and betrayal recovery coach. And I believe the betrayal uncovers the truth. Betrayal uncovers the truth of all of those unacknowledged things inside of us that we have masked and covered. And when we are brave enough to finally look at all of those things, that is where the healing begins. I would love to connect to see how I can best support you on your betrayal recovery journey so you can get to the bottom of what really happened and heal faster, skipping the mistakes, the pain, and the obsessive thoughts that plagued me during my own betrayal recovery journey. Before we go any further, I want to remind you to hop on over to betrayalrecoveryguide.com and download your copy of my Sparkle After Betrayal Recovery Guide. It will also put you on my list so you will get all sorts of good things, tools, tips, tricks, downloadable meditations, and it will keep you in the loop and help you stay strong and connected to who you are and what you want most after recovery. Today, we are going to talk about growing up. And it's a really important, (laughs) but also a really sensitive topic. Because there's such a fine line when we have been hurt when we have been victimized, when we need to step back and to be tender and compassionate with ourselves so we can heal, there's a really fine line between that and then not humbling ourselves, stepping into doing the hard work and moving from the archetype of the princess to that of the queen. And if you're not really sure what I mean by that, what I mean by that is so many of us, I don't want to say all of us because I don't exactly know how you were raised, but so many of us were raised with the belief that love was magical, that love was a fairy tale, that true love meant we would be cherished and loved and cared for. And while all of that is true, true love is so much more than that. Being in love, being in a relationship also requires us to be in a state of responsibility and accountability, not only for the other person, but for us. Most importantly, for us, for ourselves. And yes, while it's nice to have a partnership where somebody else can, you know, engage with you and support and do do some of the things and and help and, and you can really have that give and take, the bottom line is we are all responsible for our self. And that's really hard. And the reason I want to address it is because I even know from my own journey It's hard to grow up. I hate the phrase man up, (laughs) but for lack of a better phrase, that's what I'm talking about. How to like really man up and make decisions, make hard decisions and do hard things. You know, Glennon Doyle's show about we can do hard things is a really popular show. And the idea of you can do hard things and we can do hard things is kind of a thing right now. But it takes more than just the rah-rah, we can do hard things. It's how do we do hard things? 
how do we move from that, you know, cherished princess into a true queen who is sovereign over herself, over her life, and who creates and who does hard things? How do you do that? And that's what I want to talk about in this show. Because if you're anything like me, like so many of the women that I coach and work with, so many of the women that come up to me after conferences and things like that, it's hard to actually make the decision, to actually do that thing that we know inside needs to be done. And here's why. It's hard to do that thing that we know we need to do because we don't want to make a mistake. First and foremost, we don't want to make a mistake. We don't want to hurt ourselves. We don't want to let this relationship go because what if I never find a better one? We don't want to let this job go because what if this was the best that I ever had? We don't want to say or do something that irreparably damages everything for the future. We don't want to make a mistake. And that's fair. I mean, who wants to make a mistake? Nobody just wants to. Nobody sets out to go make big mistakes. But even worse than our own, yeah, I don't want to do this, is the cultural beliefs around making a mistake. There's a lot of shame around it. Like, you should know better. You should do better. Really? Why? How? Maybe you should know better or maybe you should do better if you've already done something and learned it 10,000 times. Maybe, (laughs) but maybe not. There are so many things in life where it is just kind of a guessing game. And how should you know better? And how should you do better? So that's the first thing that I want you to think about. First is, why should I know better? Or why should I do better? If there's a reason, like if you have concrete reasonings or concrete examples that this is a problem or this is going to happen, that's one thing. But otherwise, it's just kind of conjecture. The second part of that is who is going to be mad at this? We don't want to make people mad. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to upset people. The second thing is to ask yourself, Who am I impacting if things go wrong? So if you feel, if you know inside that this relationship is not really going to work for me, I don't really care about recovery, I don't want to stay. Or on the flip side, I know it doesn't really make sense, but I really feel like there's more to this story. But you're afraid to make that decision. Ask yourself, who am I afraid that I'm going to hurt? If you're afraid you're going to hurt your parents or your extended family, think about that a little bit. It's not up to you to preserve their feelings at your own expense. It's up to you to live your own life and to make your decisions. You are the sovereign queen of the universe. You are not the princess who will have things taken away if she does wrong. Thinking about the archetype of the princess, the princess is living really at the whim of other people. She is pampered. She is adored. She is given beautiful clothes and she has a tiara and everybody loves her and worships her and adores her. Why? Because she's compliant. Because she's pretty. Because she's ornamental. Because she is kind of seen and not heard. She doesn't rock the boat. A princess is kind of like arm candy. A princess is an accessory. She is a petted, pampered poodle. And you know, I'm just going to say, sometimes it's fun to be a petted, pampered poodle. (laughs) Sometimes that is fun. Because life is hard and we do do things all the time. 
and we take care of other people and it's exhausting. And sometimes it's nice just to be like, yep, let me be the accessory. You take care of me. You make all the decisions and I will just smile and be cute. But really, how long are you going to be in that role? Because if that's the role that you really want to live and die in, and you can choose that, that's totally fine. But if that's the role that you want to embody, if that is the most that you want, then that is the most that you will get. You will never be more than somebody else's accessory. And your happiness, the attention that you receive, will always be dependent on what somebody else wants to give. If they find you pleasing enough to give you attention, you will get it. And if they don't find you pleasing enough to pamper and worship, then you're not going to get it. So your entire life, you will be seeking to please others, seeking to perform for others, and seeking to conform to somebody else's expectation of who you are. And again, if that's the choice that you choose, by all means, be the queen and choose that choice and then stick with it. But all choices have consequences. All choices have consequences. So if that is the rule that you choose, the consequence is you will never be enough. You will never be enough. Because somebody is always going to want something more from you. Somebody is always going to seek something from you. And you will always, always be kept in that position of seeking to please. You will never be allowed to validate yourself. You will always be seeking to please somebody else or to prove that you are worthy enough for somebody else. So let's talk about the archetype of the queen, as opposed to the princess. Here's here's the similarities and the differences. They are both royalty. They are both special. They are both worthy. Sometimes I struggle with the archetype of royalty, Because to me, that kind of sounds like some people are inherently worthier than others. And I believe that we are all inherently worthy. But that little tiny twist aside, let's just go with that analogy. As royalty, you are worthy. As royalty, you are deserving. You are important. You are special. And let's face it, in our lives and in our personal relationships, We all want to be royalty. If we're not, if we're not treated as royalty, if we don't treat others as royalty, quite frankly, why are we together? If you see somebody in your family as the joker, why would you want to be with them? Why would you want to bring them into the fold? And if you see yourself as the joker, why would you want to be around other people who view you in that role. Find a different group of people. Find a group of people where you honor them and they honor you. So royalty, inherent worth and value and importance. That's the similarities between a princess and a queen. What makes it different, though, is the queen doesn't have to answer to anybody else. The queen makes decisions. Yes, the queen has advisors. Yes, the queen seeks counsel. But the ultimate decision is up to her. Whether it's like Queen Elizabeth, who, you know, sought the advice of prime ministers who work together Yes, the prime minister is important, but the queen has the final say. Or whether it's, you know, the more mythological, the queen and the kingdom. It's up to the queen 
to make decisions. She does not seek permission from anyone. She is wise. And again, we're talking about the archetypal queen. I don't want you thinking, well, yeah, there's queens that have been hedonistic. There's queens that have been evil. Just think about the evil queen. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the archetypal queen. The archetypal queen is wise. She does things for the good of the kingdom. She does things for the good of all. And she takes care of herself exquisitely well so she can rule and take care of her kingdom. She is fair. She is honest. She is clear. She seeks counsel and advice. She weighs the options and she makes decisions. And here's what's important too. When she's wrong, when she's made a bad decision, when she's made a mistake, she owns it and she fixes it. She doesn't blame. She doesn't shame. (laughs) She doesn't make excuses. She doesn't seek permission from anybody else. She does what she needs to do. And that's my question for you. How often are you that wise leader? How often do you need, do what you need to do? And how often, (laughs) if you're like I used to be and like so many people that I work with are, you kind of go, but I don't want to do that. And I want to say it's normal to say, I don't want to do it. We had some tremendous rains lately. Let me tell you, big time hailstorms, big time rain. And our basement flooded. And you know, (laughs) I know you could relate to this, but I come down and I look at the flood and I look at these boxes in water and I just, I just think, oh God, I can't do this. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to start pulling stuff out. I don't want to start getting shop facts. I don't want to start moving. Like, I just don't even want to start this project. It's so over my head. And I think that sometimes when I work too. You know, I'll open up email and I'll realize I'm two million emails behind and I'll think, I just don't even want to do that. I just, I just can't tackle that right now. Or same thing, it'll be time for dinner and I'll walk into the kitchen and it's like, I just can't. I just can't. And that's normal. And it's totally healthy to give yourself some compassion, some grace and some space and to listen to yourself and to realize like, If I'm not into, if I'm not down for this, I'm not doing it. And that's okay. But when it comes to some of the big things that are hard to do, that's when you have to grow up. That's when you have to dig deep. And that's when you have to do what you need to do, regardless of whether you want to do it or not. Let's talk about some of those things. If you're in a relationship, and your partner really has needs, and you really don't want to do it, there are times you just need to grow up. You need to do it. You need to pick through the hard stuff. You need to have some of those conversations. My husband and I never have been good at having conversations around finances. He tends to get triggered. I tend to get anxious. And our conversations around finance do not go well. So in the past, we have had a tendency to avoid them. Just don't have the conversation. Don't talk about it. We'll just let it go. He lost his father recently, and there's been a lot going on around, you guessed it, finances. And looking through somebody else's messed up finances makes you realize sometimes how out of control your own are. Passwords, accounts, policies, like all of these things. And it was one of those things that inside I kept thinking, I don't even want to address this. I don't want to bring it up. I know it's going to cause problems. I know he's going to get triggered. I know I'm going to get afraid. I know I'm going to have all this fear and it's not going to go well. And then I realized, you know what? (laughs) 
I'm not the scared little princess who seeks to please. If he gets triggered, he needs to own his own triggering. And if I get anxious and afraid, I need to own my own anxiety and fear. So I told him that you need to manage your triggering. I need to manage my anxiety and fear. And I also said, since so many of the benefits and policies and things came from your job, I don't know about them. So I'm also battling the sense of ignorance, the sense of shame that I didn't learn about it sooner, the sense of embarrassment that I've let so many years go by where I didn't ask relevant questions about those things. And I have to manage that. So let's come to each other and let's be honest about what we think is going to come up within us. Not what we think is going to come up in the other person. That's other kind of a a different form of othering. That's focusing on other people. And isn't it just easier to focus on other people's shortcomings? (laughs) It is so much easier to focus on other people's shortcomings than it is your own. It's so much easier to diagnose others or to tell them what they should be doing. But that's kind of not the point. Queens don't do that. Queens don't sit around and focus on other people. They take care of themselves so they can take good care of their kingdom. I guess I should be calling it a queendom, right? Anyway, so I can tell you what my husband needs to focus on, but I can also guarantee he knows what he needs to focus on. I know what I need to focus on, but it's kind of hard to admit. It's kind of hard to come up to him and say, I have fear, I have shame, I have anxiety, I have embarrassment, I have all of these negative emotions. But that's what I did. That's growing up. That's owning it. That is how do you do hard things? By doing it. You do it by doing it. How do you do it? By looking within. Not by looking outside of yourself. It's not out there. That's why I say betrayal uncovers the truth. The truth of all of those unacknowledged things inside of us. So here's all the unacknowledged things inside of me that make having financial conversations difficult. So I go to him and I say, (laughs) it's time I stepped up. I need to own this. It's important. You are a valuable person to me. We are partners doing this together. I know I have a lot of work that I need to do. And I want to start having more conversations. I want to start having healthy conversations. Do you think that's something that we can do? Are you interested in that? Didn't say one thing about him. And he said, yeah, we really need to do that. That was it for a while. Let that go. (laughs) Let it go. Hang out. Then I went and did some of my own work. I read some things on different financial benefits. I talked to our financial planner and figured out if there was a time if we could all meet together. And I also started looking at different tools. What are some tools that I can use to calm my anxiety in the moment so I don't train wreck this conversation? And I figured out Box breathing. Box breathing, where you breathe in for a certain count, like in for a count of four. You hold for a count of four. You exhale for a count of four. And then you hold empty lungs for a count of four. And you repeat that three or four times. I practiced it and I was like, hey, this box breathing really helps me re anchor into myself, into what is important to me. And for me, I even liked the idea, the visual of a box, because I was seeing my finances in the box, and I'm like, I need to manage this box. The last three shows, hopefully you've listened to them, they were conversations with the betraying partner. And they were three very intimate and deep conversations that I had with my husband, talking the first one about what his state of mind was before the affairs, what led up to that. The second one was what happened during the affairs, his state of mind around that. And then the third one was what happened after the affairs. And if you haven't checked those out, please go check them out. They are 
truly very enlightening. Anyway, one of the things that he talked about in, I believe, all three of those shows was the idea of compartmentalization. And compartmentalization is a normal, healthy thing that we all do. When we're at work or we're focusing on something, we're focusing on that task. We're not totally distracted by what's happening at home or what's happening with our friends. We kind of tune those things out and we focus on the task at hand. Same thing, like if we're cooking dinner or reading a book for fun, we're focusing on that task at hand. We're not thinking about 50 different things all at the same time. And that's compartmentalization. And that's why I liked the visual of a box in box breathing, because I needed bounds. I needed to know that I am compartmentalizing just to have these conversations around finance. I need to educate myself. I want to educate myself. As the queen of my own queendom and my own life, I need to learn this and I want to learn this. So I compartmented it. I put it in this little box. Can I do this one hard thing? Yes, I can do this one hard thing. How? By focusing on me, not focusing on the other person. By preparing for the conversation by telling him, hey, can we have this conversation? And then me doing some of the work and setting up a time and doing some reading. And then third, by giving myself a tool to manage the anxiety that I can imagine that I will feel having this conversation. Now, the next thing that I am going to do, I haven't done yet, but the next thing that I am going to do is I'm going to set a limited period of time to have this conversation. None of us can figure everything out in 10 minutes time or an hour or three hours. And the more time we lean into something, the more frustrated we are going to get and the more likely we are going to be to be triggered, to fall apart. The more likely our partners are to be triggered or to fall apart. How do you eat an elephant? bite at a time. So the next thing I'm going to do is schedule that bite. Yay, we've got our conversation with our financial planner coming up. I'm going to set that. It's going to be 90 minutes. Then I'm going to walk away. Because as the queen, I have other things to do. After that 90 minutes, I will let it go. If there's something I need to learn or follow up on, of course I will, but not in that moment. And here's the important part. I'm not going to continue to bother anybody else around that. That means I'm not going to call the financial planner 12 times that same day, nor am I going to ask my husband 49 questions that same day. I am creating healthy boundaries, both for myself and for my partner. And when I do that, when I take responsibility to create and abide by those boundaries, it ups the level of trust and safety in the relationship. It ups the levels of trust and safety in the relationships. And I want to say so much more about this. So much more. I set this conversation up for success. I didn't just all of a sudden launch into talking about something that the person I was talking to wasn't prepared for. I thought I had conversations with friends where I could kind of do my free range thinking. And I prepared because I took responsibility to set this conversation up for success because I am a queen and because my job is to make things go well. My job is not to lead my country into war. My job is not to make people so irritated that they are going to revolt or leave or yell off with her head. My job is to bring everybody in and to elevate all of us collectively. It is such a misnomer that we can just talk in relationships. It is so not true that just because we live with someone and we love someone and we're related to them, that we can just talk. Oh my gosh, of course, we all just want to talk. 
And there are times that you can just talk. You can just talk when it's not important. You can talk about the weather. You can talk about TV shows. You can talk about what's going on with people. You can talk about all of these things under the sun, but do not talk about important topics unless you have prepared for them. Just like you might prepare for a work conversation. Just like you might prepare when you're advocating for your children. When you're going to the doctor and you're helping an aging parent. When you were calling insurance and you're filing a claim and you need to advocate on behalf of yourself. You get documents pulled together. You might write down notes of the timeline and dates so you get things right. You collect your information. You pull it together. You think it through and you process it. And then this is a huge one. The person that you need to talk to, you kind of find out if now is a good time. You walk into the classroom and you see the teacher and you say, hey, is now a good time to talk about the individualized learning plan for my child? And the teacher might say, yes, let me put these papers down and um, we'll tackle this. Or no, I'm actually on my way out the door. I'm doing an after school club. Can we talk about it on Thursday? When you call insurance to file a claim, if somebody answers, you ask or they will tell you or they won't even answer. They will call you back when it's a good time or you will say, when can we talk about this? You would never just walk into a coworker's office, whether it's a boss, a subordinate, an equal coworker. You would never just spring something on somebody. You would let them know, hey, I want to talk about the whatever account. Hey, we've got some problems that are coming up here that I found. We need to talk about this. You're always asking for that person's permission because it's important. Because it's important, you need to know that they are capable and able to hear you. And if not, very rare, we might be disappointed. We might be like, dang, I was all keyed up and ready to do that, and they're not available, darn it. But very rarely would we take that personally. Yet, in our personal relationships, we feel entitled to just spring it on somebody else whenever we feel it. Hey, let me tell you about this, and blah, 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 blah. We don't know the state of mind our partner is in. Maybe they're thinking about something else. Maybe it's just not a good time. Maybe they're having some mental health struggles themselves. You've got to ask for permission. Ask for that conversation. Hey, I'd love to talk about finances. When's a good time? Or, and I've said this before and I say this to all my coaching clients, when you're talking to your partner about the affair, what's a good time? I have some difficult questions for you. I'd like to have a sensitive conversation. When can we do it? Because you're setting yourself up for success. And a queen sets herself up for success. A queen does not set herself up for failure. You set yourself up for success by asking permission is now a good time. And I'm not saying permission to speak. That's different. It's permission to have the conversation. You need to have permission to have the conversation, not permission to say what you need to say. Once you find a time where both parties can be fully present, both parties. And if somebody says, you know, I can't do it right now. How about Thursday? And Thursday is not a good day for you. Again, you can say, actually, that doesn't work. Can we look at Friday? And you come together at a mutually agreed upon date and time. So both of you understand and recognize that it's important and you can both be fully present. So once you have done that, you set the convert, you continue creating success in the conversation by only talking about what's going on for you and what you need to own. It's good to practice. It's good to prepare. It's nice if you've got a trusted girlfriend or a counselor or a coach that you can start talking these things through with because then you can talk and then you can figure out what it is that's going on on. One of the things in my coaching package, I give my clients unlimited, unlimited 
access to me. 24-7 unlimited access to me. And what I tell people to do is hop on Voxer, which is a walkie-talkie app, and start talking things through. Talk things through to me. You can pretend that I'm your partner. You can just talk to me about what's going on in your mind. Because you might be an external processor. A lot of us are. And it's really important to do that external processing and to get it out of your head. Because when you're just thinking it through, oftentimes there's loops that you don't realize are there until you say it to somebody else. And then when you say it to somebody else, then you're like, oh, there's a loop in that thinking that I didn't really understand. And then that somebody else, like me, if I'm your coach, will vox you back and be like, you are so right on with this, but this doesn't make sense. Or this is something you can control, but this is not something you can control. So what are you going to do? Why don't you start thinking about something over here? What's going to happen if somebody says this? Have you thought about that? And then you could have some of those little things, those little bugs worked out before you even have the conversation. And the conversation has less of a chance of getting derailed. And then I could also say things like, ooh, that sounds accusatory, (laughs) you know, or is that something you really want to know? Because if you really want to know that, that's one thing, but that's also something you can't unhear. So let's talk about that. How would you feel if you learn that little detail? How would you feel if you see or hear something different? And then that just gives you a chance to go a little bit deeper and again, to be more prepared and to set the conversation up for success. Again, going to the queen analogy, if you were a queen and you were dealing with heads of state from other governments or queendoms or kingdoms, are you just going to waltz into the conference room and start randomly talking about everything that your queendom needs? No. You are going to pull together relevant documents. You are going to have studies. You are going to have surveys. You are going to have laws and regulations and You are going to be prepared for the conversation. And you might even practice that conversation out loud with your trusted advisors. And you will sit around this beautiful, fancy conference table and you are going to talk things through. And you are going to say, This is what I think is best for the queendom. And people will say, My lady, that is amazing. But have you thought about blah, 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 blah? And then you're going to say, Oh, thank you. Teach me about that. Because we're not all experts at all things. We can't see everybody's different perspective. And that's what that advising is for. That's what coaching is for. When I coach with people, not only do I ask the questions to help you go deeper, but I also serve as an advocate. I'm a lawyer. I will advocate for you and for your best interests. And I will be able to advise and say things like that. So will your friends. So will your family members. So will the people that love you. They will be able to advocate for you. And they will say, that sounds really good, but I know you. And it seems like what you're saying is kind of against some of the core values that you have really, you know, (laughs) had in your life that you have demonstrated that doesn't really make sense. Can you explain to me why that's okay? And then you can go deeper and you can figure it out. Now, once you've done all this, you've set up the conversation to be successful, you've talked it out with other people so you kind of know what's going on, an important, important, important thing is knowing when to quit. I am so bad at this, by the way. (laughs) I am so bad at knowing when to quit. At least that I know that I know that I'm bad at knowing when to quit. But something that ups the safety in relationships is being able to walk away. Being able to truly disengage 
without emotion, without blame, without shame, and to walk away and to do something else fun. Because difficult conversations are difficult. How do you do it? First, by preparing, by asking permission, by practicing, but also by knowing when to quit and by giving yourself and the other person a break. Especially if you're having affair-related conversations and you want to repair the marriage. Have the difficult conversation, but then you've got to go have some fun together. Go take a break. Go take a walk in the park. Go get some ice cream. Go chill out and, you know, on the couch in front of Netflix. Do something fun. Go dance. Laugh. Watch a comedian. Do something fun together that is a complete break. And don't slip in. Well, I've got one more question. Hey, the other day when you were talking about blah, 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 blah. Stop it. That does not create safety. Your partner will be more open to you. If they can trust that we're only talking about these difficult things during our 60-minute conversation, during our 90-minute conversation, and the rest of the time I'm safe. The rest of the time, if you've got something else, write it down or ask my permission to talk. In the same way, you would not want somebody always hijacking you about the worst thing that you ever did in your life. You would want some safety. You would want to calm the nervous system because this is all about safety, psychological safety and calming the nervous system, especially if you're trying to either work things out or have a cordial relationship with your partner because you've got a co-parent and you want to have an amicable divorce. You need to be able to calm the nervous system, create safety. And when you calm the nervous system and create safety, you're in the thinking portion of your brain anyway. So you're going to have better decisions. And yeah, it's hard. And that's why I'm saying it's about growing up. It's about humbling yourself to be able to say, these are my triggers. These are the things that I struggle with. And in order to have difficult conversations, I do need to do a better job. I need to do a better job at planning or preparing, or talking it out with somebody else, or knowing when to stop. You have to know yourself. I use the analogy of burlesque a lot. And if you've listened to my show, you probably know that my burlesque name, my burlesque alter ego, is Chakrates. And I explain all about the burlesque alter ego in my book. So pick up my book, Flaunt, drop your cover, and reveal your smart, sexy, and spiritual self, and do the burlesque alter ego exercises. They are a ton of fun. But my burlesque name is Chakrates. And the reason that I suggest having a burlesque alter ego is the alter ego is that version of yourself that is fully expressed, fully revealed, and fully powerful. And it's hard to step into that queendom. It's hard to step into that fully expressed, fully powerful piece of ourselves. Because we're all worried about judgment. We're all worried about making other people happy. We're all worried about how we look. But when you have that alter ego, you can step into her. And that's what I do. And that's what I really advise people to do. And that's why I'm like, go grab that book and do those exercises. Because you're about to have a difficult conversation. Is it hard for Laura to have a difficult conversation? Yes. Laura doesn't know where to start. Laura sometimes wants to go in too many directions all at the same time. Laura's mind is like squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. But you know what? Chakra tease. Chakra's mind is focused. She is on point. She knows when to call it quit because she is fully sovereign. She is fully powerful. She doesn't care what people think. She cares about creating good. She cares about ruling with wisdom and love and divinely connected power. She cares about how she feels and she will create 
and elevate without fear. And stepping into her energy makes me, Laura, a better person. Stepping into her energy keeps my nervous system calm. It helps keep those around me who I'm in interaction with. It helps their nervous system stay calm. It keeps me out of blaming people. Yeah, well, you said this. Well, yeah, at least I'm not doing that. Well, hey, you're the one that's getting out of control. You stop yelling. You stop yelling. It breaks me out of that because it's not me. It's chakra. And she can do what I sometimes struggle with. So how do you do hard things? Sometimes you just need to step into that identity. Sometimes you need to step into your higher self. And it's just easier having a name to put with it. Because to say, I'm going to step into my highest self, great, maybe you can do that. But I need an identity. I need a name. And yeah, there's some things that I also do to help me connect with her. I've got some shimmer lotion. I can put on that shimmer lotion because I'm shimmery and powerful. I've got some powerful lip gloss. I put on my lip gloss. I put on my shimmer gloss and I am ready to rule, baby. I step into that power that is me, but that is that unwounded, undamaged, all-knowing version of me. And that's how you do hard things. And that's how you have difficult conversations. And the thing is, when I was talking about triggers too, know that you're going to have some triggers. Know it. Know what they are and find some tools to help you manage those triggers. If you need help, reach out. Again, like I found the box breath tool that works for me because my finances are in a box and I want that box taken care of. Use those little games. Use those little tools for you. Sometimes it can be like a safe word. Say your safe word. That means I got to go outside and take a walk for 10 minutes. I can't continue this right now. It might be movement. Doing a shimmy, shaking your hands. Things like that can really help dissipate energy. Experiment with different tools. And when I talk about humbling yourself and growing up, Be honest with your partner. This is what I'm going through. This is hard for me. These are my triggers and I am owning them. I'm not expecting you to manage me. I will manage me. You manage you. I'm not telling you what's wrong with you. All I'm telling you is how I'm going to manage me. And that's really hard. And I just want to acknowledge and admit growing up is hard. Doing hard things is hard. You know, like when I said, coming down from my basement, it's like, this is overwhelming. I don't even want to start. And yet I am the adult in the house and I have to start. Be the adult in the house. Be the queen of your own queendom. Be be the queen of your own life. Seek counsel. And do the hard thing by preparing by knowing your triggers, by admitting, by humbling yourself. And also by listening to feedback. Feedback by trusted people is an important thing. Again, last week, my husband came to me after meeting with his therapist. And he said, I'd like to have a talk, asking permission. And I said, now would actually be a really good time because I'm dying to hear what you talked about in counseling. And he said, well, I actually had some questions around you and I want to share some information about you. Okay, that's a big gulp. But again, he asked for permission and he wanted to share some information. He's not telling me, you did this wrong. And it was already, you know, it's like you feel your back come up. You're like, and I said, okay, but after you share it, I'm going to want to walk away. After you share it, I don't want to talk about it because I'm sure I will be feeling defensive and I will want to defend myself and I won't really let it land. 
So let's share it gently, please. And that's another thing. You can ask somebody, do you want to hear this gently? Or do you want to hear it? Or do you want me to be blunt? And I said, share it gently. And then let's walk away. And I'm going to need some time alone to process. And he was like, okay, that's totally fine. And he shared some information with me. And sure enough, I felt defensive. I felt like, I don't want to have to do all that. That's your problem. That's not my problem. I don't need to. It was about giving him some more attention and some different things that I do when I don't give the attention, when I get so locked into my work and my focus that I ignore what's going on around me. And sure enough, I wanted to defend myself. I wanted to explain. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but when I start working, it da 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 Well, yeah, but when I'm on a roll, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it was like, nope just here, just listen. And I walked away and I processed and we didn't say anything for the rest of the day because I just wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to own it. And it wasn't until the next day. And I went to him and same thing I asked. I said, I'd love to revisit our conversation um, from yesterday if you've got time. And he's like, yeah, now would be a great time. And I was like, okay, here's what I really need to own. Here's what was really spot on about that, and I appreciate it, and I want to be a better partner to you. And because I want to be a better partner to you, I'm hearing that and I'm understanding it, and here's what I can do differently about acknowledging you and paying attention to you when you really have something important that you want to say to me. And here's how I'm not going to dismiss you, and I'm doing that because I want to be a better partner. And I thank you for bringing that to me. And he also had some stuff about boundaries. And on that part, I said, I hear what you're saying. I hear that you want to set more boundaries to protect your mental health kind of against me in a way. And then I said, but I also want the same. I also want more boundaries that I can set kind of against you because I think it's good for both of us and I think it's good for both of us to strengthen our boundaries. So I will hear and accept about giving you some more attention and being more open to that. And I also hear and accept what you're saying about boundaries, but I also have my own ask on that. And it's the reciprocity on that. I think we both need some different boundaries on that. And then same thing. He's like, you know, I actually hear that right away. Um, I'll think about it, see if there's anything else that I want to say. But yeah, that totally makes sense. And I think maybe we can revisit that conversation a little bit later. And I'm like, yep. So what do you want for dinner? And we moved on. And that's just such a healthy way to continue to have those difficult conversations. It's like I said, the bite of the elephant, bite at a time. It's talking about it. It's sitting with it. It's deciding. I decided I want to be a better partner. I am perfectly within my right to say, you know what? I'm just, I'm focused on my work and that's my first and foremost, and I'm not going to stop and take care of you. But I chose to be a better partner and that is my choice. And it's also my choice if I didn't want to. But he's asking me to do certain things in order to partner him better. And I choose yes. And I'm choosing yes because of my desire to be a better partner. Not because I feel like I have to serve him. But because I can step into my sovereignty and my power and I can be a queen and I can say, yes, this is important to me and I'm going to do what is important. And I'm going to do what it takes to get the relationship that I want. And your happiness is important to me. And then same thing, you know, like on the boundaries thing, we were talking about strengthening our personal boundaries. That's still taking thought. He needs to continue to think, what does it mean? And then one of the things we talked about briefly was, okay, so let's talk about if we're both going to strengthen some of our own personal boundaries, then we also need to talk about violation of those boundaries. Because chances are, Some of those boundaries might be violated, at least in the beginning, when we're kind of renegotiating some things. 
So what happens when those boundaries are violated? And how do we respond again in love and in honoring each other by saying, hey, here was the rule. Here's what got violated. How do we move forward? But again, it's all about because of my power, because of his power, stepping into our agency, stepping into our authority, being the king and queen of ourselves and choosing and knowing that we want more, that we deserve better and doing what it takes to ensure that those better things that we want and deserve will each come our way. Thank you for being with me today. It is my wish that we all become queens of our own queendom, that we all do what is best for us, for those around us, and that we all become abundantly clear of who we are and what we deserve, and that we have the power and the ability to say and do the hard things so we can get what we want and what we deserve. Hop on over to BetrayalRecoveryGuide.com and download your copy of the Sparkle After Betrayal Recovery Guide. And let's take this journey into personal power and sovereignty together. Have an amazing week and always remember to flaunt exactly who you are because who you are is always more than enough. Tune in next time to Flaunt, Find Your Sparkle, and Create a Life You Love After Infidelity or Betrayal with radio host and live choreographer Laura Cheadle every Wednesday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Time on syndicated Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. Develop naked self-worth and reclaim your confidence, enthusiasm, and joy so you can create a life you love and embrace who you are today. Download your free Sparkle Through Betrayal Recovery Guide at NakedSelfWorth.com. 